Uh, your pages have numbers, by the way, which is unusual for me, as you know. And so um, um, let's start at page four. <laughs> um, <laughs> it looks like that. And uh, I presume that, um, that probably all of you, well, let me do it the other way. Is there anybody in here who has not read Think and Grow Rich? Elliot, really? You're kidding me. Did you raise your hand too? I haven't read it all. Like it, it, well, it ain't that thick. I mean, you know. I mean, I know you're skinny, but you gotta go to the you go to the bathroom once a day, don't you? You know, a couple pages every day. I mean, in a month or so, you're done, you know, unless you're stopped up. I mean, <laughs> gee whiz. Um, <laughs> Jim, Jim Rohn used to talk about recommending the book to people when it was still only in hardcover and have people tell them, well, you know, I'm going to wait till it comes out in paperback. Um, uh, may I make a recommendation? Yeah. Uh, uh, how many have read Hill's other stuff? The, the laws of success that it came from, uh, grow rich with peace of mind, uh, not so many. Best book, best book of the bunch. You should, you should get your hands on uh, that one. It's the one he wrote latest in life, and uh, it's probably uh, grow rich with peace of mind. Um, it's probably the best of the bunch. Uh, how about uh, succeed and grow rich through persuasion? Oh, hardly any. Isn't that interesting? Was that by Hill? Napoleon Hill. Uh, it was written for a uh, company called Holiday Magic, which was a, uh, a what today we would call multi-level, um, what the regulatory folks call pyramid scheme. Uh, it was written for a guy by the name of William Penn Patrick at Holiday Magic um, as a combination sales tool for the distributors and a credibility device for Penn Patrick and Holiday Magic because he's all through the book. You don't know looking at it that it was written for Holiday Magic. That, in fact, was the point. Uh, as an aside, by the way, you can trace a lot of the self-improvement industry back to that. Um, um, uh, uh, Zig was in Holiday Magic, um, Warner Earhart, was in Holiday Magic before he was called Warner Earhart. Um, uh, Jim Rohn, who of course essentially birthed Tony. Um, and so you can trace the lineage of a lot of this back to Penn Patrick. Uh, anyway, so you're all familiar with, uh, with uh, Hill's work. Oh, and Phil brought me, which I'll show you later because there's something in it I want to quote. Um, Phil Alexander, who's all the way in the back next to the camera, um, Phil is a great finder of, of ancient artifacts, uh, and he's got two copies of the Napoleon Hill magazine from 1921, uh, which sold for 25 cents a copy, by the way, and um, was one of the many uh, Hill business ventures that lasted a relatively short period of time, so there's not a lot of additions, but it's a real interesting thing to see. Um, what a lot of people are not real cognizant of, and I want to be careful about this because I don't want to in any way invalidate uh, anything in the books, um, but like so many of us, there's a vast difference between um, identifying what works, putting what works down in a book, and then actually doing it. And um, uh, Hill uh, spent the latter years of his life fundamentally broke. And uh, a lot of people don't know that. Uh, but uh, at one point in time, um, um, I remember seeing a classified ad in Success Magazine where he, his original uh, typewriter was for sale for 50 bucks or best bid above 50. Um, and um, Hill was, Napoleon Hill was basically rescued late in life by Clem Stone and uh, put to work as a sales trainer 
four combined insurance companies of America. And um, uh, that was like pretty much the last things he did in his career before he retired. And Stone basically kind of made him economically whole. Uh, but when Stone got him, he was basically broke. By the way, there's another product you might want. Nightingale Conant has, and they don't advertise it, but they have a set of videos of Napoleon Hill, uh, the title of which completely escapes me. But what they really are, they're black and white, and what they really are are films of the sales training classes uh, at Clemstone's insurance company. And I think they're the only video available with Hill on them. Phil, you can, prob you can probably find a set on uh, eBay, God help us all, for $18.72 <laughs> or something. But I think they're 300 bucks if you buy them from Nightingale. And, and undoubtedly, one of the reasons Nightingale doesn't advertise them much is their underwear tightens up at the thought of asking anybody for $300. Uh, but, um, uh, uh, but, but they do have them, and they will grudgingly let you buy them if you, if you pursue them. Uh, and I recommend them. They're, they're really fascinating. Uh, anyway, uh, Hill, who, you know, more, according to Inc. Magazine, more self-made millionaires put Think and Grow Rich on their list of books that have influenced them than any other book other than the Bible. And um, um, just about everybody in my circle, I mean, you couldn't walk into one of my client's offices and not find the whole library. And, uh, so here's the guy who wrote, if you will, the, um, the Bible about uh, prosperity, who winds up broke. And isn't that disturbing? And why is that? And Clem Stone, who was inspired by Napoleon Hill's work, winds up very, 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 very rich. Uh, Stone, finally, he passed away not too long ago. Uh, at the ripe old age of 212 or something. <laughs> and, uh, 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 um, basically, he was, he, was, he, he was too mean to die. Uh, um, I'm sure that was one of those funerals where there were people there out of respect and there were people there who wanted to make sure. Uh, um, um, he, uh, we, I met him and spent a little time with him when we did the Think and Grow Rich infomercial at Guthy Ranker, and uh, he 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 was then way up there, and uh, tough as nails. Uh, but he and now the Napoleon Hill Foundation, which he created, own all the intellectual property rights to all of the Hill stuff, and they believe they own the rights to like any word that might somewhere have been said once by Napoleon Hill. Um, and um, they, they have a very aggressive law firm. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one well, I know. H anybody in here uh, deal with that yet besides me? You have, haven't you? Yeah. Um, yeah, Phil, you have. Um, they, they actually uh, will come after you for using the word success or uh, philosophy. Um, and, <laughs> and, and pretty aggressively, too. Um, uh, but uh, they, they, they and Disney, I think, are the two most aggressive protectors of intellectual property on the planet. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, so Stone winds up really, really, really rich. And Hill winds up really, really, really poor. Although for a brief period in his time in his life, he was loaded. He was what the millionaire next door guys call, what the financial planning industry calls, high income underinvested. Um, uh, and having, meaning Rolls Royces, um, you know, um, overbuilt mansions that when they are sold, they sell for 20% of what they cost to build, that kind of stuff. Um, um, having been one of those myself, I have some empathy for him. Uh, but uh, anyway, he winds up broke, Stone winds up rich. And um, when I first heard this, um, it was disturbing to me. And then my curiosity was enormously aroused. And um, one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit uh, today and wind up with, uh, what I'll end with today is the paramount and primary reason, I believe, that um, 
that, uh, that Stone was rich and Hill was poor. Uh, but one is that uh, Napoleon Hill had a philosophy built upon mostly observation, research, interviews. You guys all know the story, um, which like all stories, incidentally, is slightly romanticized. Um, uh, but um, uh, predominantly through observation, he had a philosophy. Stone took it and applied it, um, and the key word is applied or application, in an environment where it had a reasonable opportunity to produce money. And there's a real practical lesson there. Um, uh, which we'll come back to. The first half of the day, I thought we'd spend on the, somebody ask a question. Uh, it's in the questions, the stack of questions, um, about me often referring to metaphysical stuff as, you know, airy-fairy, uh, you know, sort of in a joking, or they took it as a derogatory manner, and then, but you use it. And, um, I took a class once in metaphysics, by the way. I failed the final exam. I was caught cheating looking into the soul of the person next to me. <laughs> um, uh, the, um, that's for you. you. You can use it. Um, um, I, uh, I've tried to, f to approach these things from a practical standpoint. And I find that a whole lot of the people who talk about this stuff, a whole lot of the people I've read, a whole lot of the people that I've met, uh, their flaw in the ointment, in my opinion, is they uh, are in, Dick Sutphin used to call them the sackcloth and ashes crowd. Um, uh, 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 you know, they're into every part of the metaphysics except practical application. And, uh, you know, you can't, I had an early mentor who said you can't eat philosophy. And uh, you can't go down to the bank and put philosophy on a bank deposit slip. Uh, and uh, he's, he's absolutely right. And so practical application is, is critically important. But there are some conceptual things. And so I thought the first half of the day we talk about some conceptual things. Um, and uh, during the course of the day, uh, I know there's, there's a couple of people came up this morning, again, impressed me. I know there's immense curiosity about um, uh, my personal sort of rituals and use of these things, which I'll be happy to tell you. Uh, but a lot of what I have to tell you is also from observation. Uh, one of the neat things about the way I've made my living is uh, I've got to hang around with a whole lot of uh, very affluent people, most of whom uh, did not start with much and have built large incomes and in many cases some of them just large incomes and no wealth but in many cases um, a great deal of uh, wealth and uh, I tried to figure it up before this seminar I actually went through old client lists and current client lists and I finally stopped at 130 some odd people that I that I know for a fact are in the double-digit millions to $10 million net worth range who pretty much were at, at zero or, you know, just a decent income but no real wealth um, uh, at one point in time. And so I've spent a lot of time with 130 plus of these people, more time with some than others. And um, in recent years, I've seen a fair number of people. We commented on it yesterday. Those of you that weren't here yesterday, the difference between the, uh, the growth that has occurred, and this is a compliment, by the way, for many of you, the growth that has occurred in many of the people who are at this alumni event from as recently as the prior alumni event uh, is striking. And, and, and the growth is in two areas. It's in mechanical or technical skill. I mean, the, the effectiveness of their marketing what they had to show versus what they had shown us before, um, uh, uh, their, the improvement in their copywriting skills, the improvement in their ability to craft offers, all of that um, is really quite remarkable. Um, and there are any number of people in this room who've gone in the last two or three years from 
modest incomes to very big incomes. A number of people in this room who their current monthly income was their annual income. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, um, uh, it, 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 there's commonalities there too. You watch enough of them, you notice a few things. Um, the other kind of growth is attitudinal, which is a little harder to put your finger on, but, you know, it's a closed loop. Um, so, I thought we'd do the conceptual stuff this morning and uh, then the practical application stuff this afternoon. And, uh, and if we have time, which I suspect we will, a bunch of you have turned in questions. Um, this time I've looked at them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, thrown out a few, um, none of which rival the first question of uh, yesterday. Um, so, you should be on page number five. And page five and six, actually. Um, people actually think, and, and get ingrained in their heads, that there's some kind of zero-sum game going on here. That money taken from this person and moved to this person um, enriches this person at the expense of that person. And um, uh, certainly the liberal politicians either believe it or pander to it, one or the other. Uh, but a whole lot of people have it operating at a beneath the surface level that affects a lot of what they do and, um, and inhibits uh, them in a lot of different ways. What they'll charge, for example, uh, who they'll ask for money. Uh, everybody in direct sales, um, Zig has a true story. Uh, Glenn Turner has a true story. I've got a true story. Everybody who's ever done direct sales much, by the way, is Bill Dris Driscoll here today or did Bill leave? Oh, Bill's here? Okay. I'll bet you got a story. Because um, um, what's the current price point for an uh, average house for a fire alarm installation? Uh, 17, 1800. Okay. Um, what, 10 years ago, 800? 900? Yeah, probably 900. Yeah, okay. So 10 years ago, my frame of reference for a fire alarm sale, a vacuum cleaner sale, uh, a water purifier sale, a pot and pan sale, about 800 bucks. 20 years ago, 500, right? Yeah. And now you guys have got it up to 1,700. Um, so this salesman, by the way, if any of you ever, let's see, how many of you have had a pot and pan pitch made to you in your house? God, you guys are deprived. How many of you have had a vacuum cleaner pitch made to you in your house? Okay, there's more of that. How many of you have had a fire alarm pitch made, made to you in your house? Oh, good. Hey, guys, somebody's out there. Um, uh, okay, now how many of you have done any one of the three for a living? All right, well, every one of you has this story. Okay? Because, oh, let's do books, too. It's like encyclopedia. Okay, there you go. Okay. Every one of you who's done this has some version of this story. You've seen it. Um, uh, and, and now it's 1700 bucks. Of course, it's probably even more profound. So the fire alarm salesman with the stuffed Dalmatian under his arm and the, and, 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 and the crying dog film and, the, you know, marches into the house and, and, and discovers that uh, he is in a place of relative poverty, at least by his standards. He is sitting across the table. The two kids uh, are in on a threadbare carpet in the living room. Um, they probably have a good television, but pretty much everything else in the house, um, um, pretty much everything else in the house um, is obviously uh, hand-me-down, beat up, falling apart, springs sticking up out of the couch seat. Um, uh, you know, it, you just clearly uh, know that these people, you know, aren't doing well. Conversationally, you know, you discover, you know, Papa hadn't worked in four months and 
you know, the kid's got some kind of problem that causes big medical bills, and on and on and on and on. And uh, the salesperson becomes increasingly queasy about closing these people on the $1,700 fire alarm sale or the, or the what's a VAC now? 1700 bucks, huh? On the $1,700 vacuum cleaner. And so the salesperson becomes increasingly queasy about this. And, um, and in many cases, will not close. He'll deliberately throw the game at the end and uh, toss that one aside and get out of there. Okay. And uh, everybody then who has done this for any period of time has the person who, who rises up in the middle of the weak, wimpy, attempt to throw the ball game close and is almost offended that they are not trying to sell it to them. Um, Glenn tells a story of actually being chased uh, by somebody who was mad that he wouldn't sell him a sewing machine. Zig has a similar pot and pan story. Uh, if you've heard Zig's story about the indoor plumbing customer, that was saving up the money to put in indoor plumbing. Um, and then uh, he backed off, and the people were annoyed, and they really wanted the pots and pans. Um, still works. Huh? Still works. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still yeah, yeah, yeah. They put indoor plumbing in next year, but, you know, got to get the pots now. And, of course, the pots pay for themselves, you know, because they say, you know. Um, <laughs> So really, they're free after 24 months of what you saved on utilities. Um, uh, the queasiness about price, about who somebody is selling to, uh, about their ability to pay, their ability to afford it, anytime you start to make those decisions for other people, um, uh, it, it really reflects more about what's going on internally with you than it does with anything else. And the other thing to remember is, is that uh, people who are without money that you perceive to be disadvantaged for one reason or another and you question whether you should uh, sell them something, Regardless of whether you get any of their money or not, they're going to be without money next week, too. The reason they're without money has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with your existence, nor does it have to do with the way money works in the real world. It has to do with them. And whether you take it, somebody else takes it, the liquor store takes it, the, the church takes it, whoever takes it, I promise you somebody's getting it. Because if they're without money now, they're going to be without money again. And most of them are going to be without money permanently because they never fix the things that we're talking about that have to do with whether or not you have money. And it happens at all levels. I mean, we have people selling $50,000 programs to doctors. Um, at one time, um, Tracy's, I get all confused with familial relationships. Is Rod your uncle? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, I mean, Rodney and I were selling a $36,000 program to doctors in the early 80s. And at least 70% of the doctors who bought couldn't afford to pay attention. I mean, let alone a $36,000 program. Uh, but when you're selling help to people, when you're selling, when you're a success merchant, you always, you, there's only two buyers. There's the already extremely successful who don't need it who buy everything because they practice the principle of a slight edge, and there's the starving and desperate looking for a life raft. The middle is not the market. And so if you only took the rich, you would starve. Um, and so the queasiness has to go away. You got this doctor who, uh, who just had his car repossessed, is having trouble keeping the lights on in the office, and uh, um, uh, is getting more calls from bill collectors than he is from new patients, 
and uh, you're going to walk him down to four different finance companies and blast six of his credit cards to get $36,000 from him to put him into a management program. You can't have any queasiness. You can't have any a reluctance. And you have to understand that the reason he's where he is has nothing to do with you, the guy who came before you, the guy who came after you. It all has to do with him. And there's plenty of money to go around. Nobody's ever go run out of dough. And there's no excuse to be broke in America. Anybody can tomorrow start from zero and they can get a bucket and a sponge or they can, you know, and these chiropractors. I mean, it's, I, I know lawyers who are broke. Can you imagine this? <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. They get out of school with a license to steal money. Mm -hmm. And some of these people can't cut it. Well, it has nothing to do with any shortages. It has nothing to do with any money anybody takes from them. It totally has to do with them. There's plenty of dough. And now we have all the recession stuff going on, you know, and the media is desperately trying to sell everybody the idea uh, that things are bad and are going to get worse um, for a variety of reasons. And so some people will believe that now that there's a shortage of money because there's a war. Other people think there's a shortage of money because there's a tax cut. Other people think there's no shortage of money. There's money everywhere. Just walk around, look around, you know. And you've got to get past the zero-sum game idea that when somebody gives up money to you that you've profited and they've lost and there's less money over here now than there is over here, the, the money just keeps replenishing. It's always there, it's just some people don't see it, and some people aren't smart enough to bend over and pick it up. But it's always there, and there's plenty of it. The other big thing to get is there's mountains of dumb money out there. <laughs> right. And so if you want to, you can more than satisfy your needs just dipping into the pond of dumb money. One of my favorites, this is, I forget what catalog this is from. It's not Neiman Marcus, which you usually find this stuff in Neiman's. It's not Neiman Marcus, but here's, I don't know what catalog this is. Gentleman's Domain. This is owned by Frontgate. This thing's been in for three catalogs. They ain't wasting the space to have fun. For, where's the price point here? The, uh, the Eli Bridge Company in Jacksonville, Illinois. Now give these guys points if they initiated this for getting themselves in a catalog. The Eli Bridge Company um, builds amusement park rides, like the famous Scrambler, which is this thing. Right. They've been building them for 100 years. And now, for only 300,000 bucks, <laughs> They'll put that thing in your backyard. <laughs> They'll build you a 67-foot high, 16-seat Ferris wheel. You'll need a 220-volt power outlet. Gee, no shit. Um, and since it weighs almost 20 tons, you may want to have the patio checked out before getting started. <laughs> Forrest, Forrest. <laughs> For it. By the way, that's right, you saw the Shed Shop infomercial. The, the, the happy couple with the two sheds in their backyard, the his and her sheds, they're both retired and they're on Social Security and he's got one small pension. They're totally on fixed incomes. Two sheds. One ain't enough. <laughs> the guy with the shed and the big pond in his backyard, you remember him? Oh, you should have heard his sob story. <laughs> if you heard the sob story first, you would never think this guy's going to pop for 20 grand of landscaping, a koi pond, and a shed in his backyard. I mean, the poor soul hadn't got two nickels. His whole family doesn't have two nickels. But somebody sold him a koi pond. <laughs> and he likes his koi pond. 
For a $75,000 upsell, you can get the mobile model. <laughs> These guys are funny. That folds for compact storage in, in, in any 80-foot long garage. <laughs> You can take care of this, by the way, on three easy payments. Um, Nokia has a new uh, line of cell phones. And I know there are some of you in the room who like the latest doohickey. So if you don't have this, you've got to have it. It's made out of gold and platinum. And it sells for $20,000. It is an experiment in exquisite design and craftsmanship. Oh, it's also large, because obviously you don't want to have a $20,000 phone and have somebody not see it. <laughs> um, um, remember, years ago, a friend of mine got rather, I thought, oversized breast implants and began to dress rather provocatively. And her answer to that was, if you buy a new Jaguar, you don't leave it in the garage with a tarp on it. <laughs> um, um, anyway, this, um, this oversized phone, here's how they explain this. There's a size to proportion balance that has a calming effect. <laughs> yeah, $20,000 phone. Um, I had a client that sold a $3,000 coffee pot. I mean, that's even better than a $1,700 vacuum cleaner. Um, there's plenty of money. And by the way, everybody, including everybody in here, has some kind of interest on which they spend dumb money. They spend silly amounts of money. Every single person on the planet does. You can play golf. Dumb money. Well, first of all, golf only exists because of marriage. Okay. No, there would be no golf. It had to have been invented. It was invented in Scotland, right? The guys had to be married. This is a conversation of we can't get out of the house. How are we going to get out of the house? We'll invent this game. Okay? And we'll make it look so stupid, they'll actually feel sorry for us playing it. So we won't use a straight stick. We'll have a doofusy looking bent stick. Okay? We'll make the game about hitting on a little ball into a little hole, but let's put the hole like 400 yards away. <laughs> That'll be good. Okay? We'll make it a long walk. I mean, seriously, the only reason golf exists is because four guys can't figure out how to get out of the house with a better excuse than this. And, and, and if they all go to their wives and say, we're going to go hang out for four hours in a bar and tell our dirty jokes to each other, <laughs> the wives say, no, you're not. But they say, we're going to go play golf. Oh, well, all right, go play golf. So golf was invented because of marriage. But I mean, if you play golf, think of the dumb money you spend. I mean, and the people who sell to golfers know. It's what Jeff Paul calls the irrationally rabid market, meaning all, san all sanity goes out the window. We'll spend any amount of money on that pastime. Every one of you has one of them. Might be boats, might be airplanes, might be raising Vietnamese pot belly pigs, might be racehorses, might be whatever it is, but we all got something we spend dumb money on. In, um, any amount. Doesn't make any difference, right? Everybody's got at least one. Some people have, like, multiples. All right? Um, and, and everybody's got one. Even poor people got them. Even poor people got them. Now, it's proportionate spending, but even poor people got them. My brother's got no money, but he's got one of the most expensive pool tables you can buy. He's got a handmade scientifically bioengineered, computer designed, imported from somewhere, personal cue stick. Yeah, good. He's got a car 
that none of you would get in. But he's got a Q-stick. The Q-stick's worth more than the car. Right? Doesn't bother him. Pool is his thing. Yeah, he is pretty good. Not good enough to make any money, but, but that's, I mean, he probably is good enough to make money. But, um, so, so there's all this money floating around being spent on all this stuff. And then people get tight about, oh, I'm a little queasy about closing this guy on $1,700 worth of fire alarms. Hey, at least you're keeping him from burning to death. You know? I mean, a vacuum cleaner, at least the house is going to be clean. Uh, you know, the $1,700 pool cue ain't doing him a whole lot of good. I mean, so there's all this money floating around, and yet people are all kind of tight. And I mean, you've seen it in our group how hard I've had to work just on price. Just to get people to inch up their prices. And some of that, fear-based, but some of it is this issue of taking too much money from somebody. You know, I'm taking an unfair amount of money from them. I'm handicapping them. Well, what's all that based on? It's based on the thought that there's not enough money to go around and that it's very hard for them to replace that money. It's based on the idea that money's hard to replace. If you substitute the idea that money's easy to replace, then all the trepidation about how much you take from any one given person for whatever it is that you do goes out the window because it's easily replaceable. Very fluid. And it is easily replaceable. It's the easiest thing there is on the planet to replace. House burns down. The house you can replace, furniture, you, can, you know, the pictures, your family heirlooms, your, that kind of stuff you can't replace. But the rest of it's easily replaceable. Money's easy to replace. But people think it's hard to replace, and everything they do is then kind of governed by that conditioning. The people who attract tons of money and have no hang-ups about taking it have come to the conclusion that there's an abundant supply of it more than anybody could ever possibly use and that it's easy to get more of it. We did the show of hands yesterday, um, the incredible commonality amongst successful entrepreneurs of those who have been broke or formerly gone through bankruptcy. And for those of you that won't hear yesterday, I mean, it's like the majority of the hands. Um, um, and has somebody said the rest of them are lying? <laughs> um, uh, but I believe the reason that is is because it's a ma that whole experience is a major step in discovering how easy it is to replace it. Because at the time you think it's terminal, at the time you think it's fatal, because you think money's hard to replace. And then when you recover, realization begins to dawn. So the first big impediment to getting money is the idea that there are limits to it, that it's a zero-sum game, that it's hard to replace, that you harm somebody by taking their hard-to-replace money from them. There's a term people use. You know the term? We use it when, in some cases in sales copy. You have to be careful about the vocabulary you use when you sell versus the vocabulary you believe. Here's the term, hard-earned dollars. All recognize the term, don't you? Hard-earned dollars. It's the implication. Hard to get them. Those of you that got, how many got kids? And how many times in the past month have you explained to the kids that money doesn't grow on <laughs> trees? Where does that come from? Well, it's because everybody becomes their father, right? That's the deal. You know, and you find yourself saying the same crap that used to annoy you when they said, we don't even think about it. It's been programmed in, and now at a particular point in time in life, we're regurgitating it and spitting it back out with no thought about what it's doing to us or what it's doing to the person that we're saying it to. But when we say it, what belief system are we, we communicating? Hard to get. Yeah. 
And any reinforcement of that that's going on for you is detrimental to you. It'll bind you up in all sorts of ways that you can't imagine. If you're thinking, it's hard to get. Um, this, this is not in your manual, but I like it. Here's the caption. I know you missed the Wayne rights, Bobby, but they were weak and stupid people, and that's why we have wolves and other large predators. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think this is your page eight. Here's programming that doesn't help you any. There's a whole now economic political push about excessive profits. Right? And you will hear that term more and more and more and more and more in the media. It's in places it shouldn't be, like the Wall Street Journal. Fortune. Yeah, you won't find it. I haven't found it in Forbes, by the way, and I read Forbes every month. I haven't found it in Forbes. But you'll find it in the Wall Street Journal. There's a lot of talk about this whole issue of excess profits. And those of you that are incorporated undoubtedly know you're only allowed to take so much profit out of your own company every year without paying excess distribution taxes. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're taking too much money. Um, and there's an idea, for example, much proliferated attributed to Rockefeller, which he never had anything to do with, that the, the, the top person's compensation in a company should only be a preset multiple of the lowest wage paid in the same company. And so there's a lot of talk about the outrageousness of CEO compensation has a ratio against what the broom pushing person's wage is. And so everybody's getting beat up on this idea of excess profits. And the ratio argument, for example, the CEO compensation is controlled by marketplace value. And if the guy takes too much money too many times in a row, the marketplace catches up to him and he's gone. All right? So everybody like right now is screaming and yelling about Eisner and a handful of guys who took their $20 million bonuses last year, even though shareholder value went down 18%, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, if in fact he's being irrationally and unfairly compensated, a couple of years from now, he'll be where the CEO of Sprint is this year. He'll be gone. And he'll pay hell getting hired anyplace else. The marketplace catches up. Okay? But what the ratio argument completely ignores is his compensation is determined by marketplace value, even if, it, even if it's a trailing indicator rather than a predictive indicator. The guy who pushes the broom, that job has a finite, definable worth. And if you base one on the other, there's no real rationale for that. It sounds good when you talk about it, but it doesn't make any sense. Further, incidentally, the longevity argument, big problem for those of you that employ people, right? Because employees, employee mentality has been taught that the longer you do a job, the more you should be paid for doing it. Right? That our, the union is based on that. Mm -hmm. However, certain jobs only have a certain value. Doesn't matter how long you do them. If you tighten a bolt on the side of a doohickey, that's worth X cents, period. It can't be worth Y cents just because you've been standing there tightening the same bolt for 50 years. You didn't add any value to the, you're not tightening the bolt 50 times faster. That would make the job worth more money. You're not tightening the bolt in a way that cut the recall rate by 50%. That would make the job worth more money. But just tightening the same bolt at the same speed just because you've been doing it for 50 years didn't add any value to anything. But as you know, if you employ people, what do they expect? 
annual rate, sure, periodic raises. Why? Why is that job worth any more this year than it was last year? Arguably, it might be worth even less. <laughs> but it doesn't inherently become worth more, but people think it. And so they have in their head, I'm not, I'm not going to, I will stop and do it, okay? They have in their head now uh, that it should be. The second thing on the list is this, this entire topic of people who are less fortunate uh, than you are. Um, there are some such people. Um, I mean, there's a, obviously there's an enormous amount of economic ignorance in the country. And people who've never had any exposure, you know, you can't really fault somebody for not getting a bucket and a sponge and going out there and being entrepreneurial and getting rich if they've never seen it. If they have no exposure to it, if they don't, if they don't know it exists. Uh, but often, those less fortunate, that's a synonym purely for those less industrious. It's not that they haven't seen it. It's not that they don't know. It's certainly not that they couldn't go see it. They just don't. And to have guilt about them. But a lot of people have their money-making capabilities suppressed by guilt about these kind of issues. Oh, there's all these people less fortunate than I, therefore it would somehow be better if I didn't keep the next thing, the gap, if the gap didn't keep getting wider. Well, the gap, now here's some stats. This is really important because people don't get it. Inflation-adjusted incomes of families from 1998 to 2001 rose across all demographic groups. That's Ronald Reagan's rising tide lifts all boats. There's no way to raise the lower level without raising the top level. Can't happen. If we don't get richer, they can't get less poor. Can't happen. It's economically impossible. And so the old joke, the best thing you can do for the poor people is not be one of them. <laughs> Second best thing for you to do, do, do for them is get as rich as you possibly can. Because you're automatically going to pull some up. Why? Because you're going to spend more dumb money. And the more dumb money that's out there floating around, the more everybody benefits. But there's the argument about the widening gap. Oh, we got to do something about the gap. Got to do something about the gap. The gap's no wider than it's ever been. It's just more visible. There's always going to be a big gap. The issue of greed. Too often achievement, accomplishment, ambition is defined as greed. is getting the most money possible for the goods or services you deliver, greed or intelligence? Is it greed or ambition? Are you a better person if you voluntarily get less money than you could for the goods or the services you deliver? If these guys suddenly reduce their price on fire alarms to $1,400 from $1,700, did the door into heaven get any wider when Driscoll drops? Opportunist. American Greetings, maybe you've seen this in the news. American Greetings has rushed to the presses uh, with a line of greeting cards to be sent to the military in Iraq. And so if you have somebody over there you want to send a greeting card to, by the way, they're in the stores. Uh, and there's, um, there's what they call the romantic ones. Um, there's a picture of a great looking babe in a camouflage uh, 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 long piece of lingerie standing next to a bed. Um, uh, and the caption is, I've got some maneuvers to show you when you get home. Um, 
Uh, there's ones for brothers, there's one for sisters, there's one, they've created a whole line. And they're getting massive publicity, by the way, as a result of this. CNN, MSNBC, Entertainment Tonight, USA Today. Uh, I saw the first big critical discussion of this uh, on some talk show uh, last night, in which it should come to no surprise to any of us that um, uh, Janine Grimofalo, whatever her name is, uh, thinks this is horrible, um, that we are profiteering, some company is profiteering on, 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 on this tragic series of events. And if in fact they are going to sell these things, they should be giving all the money away. Yeah. Um, well, of course, that's exactly the point. Good point. Yeah, Elliot said as if she's not profiteering from the interview. Of course. Uh, now, she may devoutly believe her position. I, by the way, I happen to think I would put her in a category with Hillary. And I mean, I think she believes her shtick. And, 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 and by the way, I, no, of course not. And I have, I have more respect for somebody I devoutly disagree with who devoutly believes their position than I do anybody else. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I don't begrudge her getting on TV and mouthing off about it either. But it is, it is an illustration of a position that is very often taken about this thing called opportunism. And yet what opportunism is, is entrepreneurship. That's what it is. See, every man's tragedy is somebody else's opportunity. That's commerce. Fire alarm business wouldn't exist if there weren't fires. You can't sell alarms if somebody wasn't having a house burned down around them. If there were no deaths, there'd be no business. So now they position their business as, as the mission to protect people, to save lives. That's how they sell it. But it wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the tragic problem in the first place. Cops wouldn't have jobs if there was no crime. If we could eliminate all the crime tomorrow, we'd have, I don't know, how many cops are there? Clinton claims he put another 100,000 on the streets. So I don't know, millions unemployed. Now what do we do? Now what? See, all commerce, the whole flow of where money moves, a big reason money moves is tragedy, disaster, crisis, problems, ugly, horrible human events. So one man's tragedy is another man's opportunity. Entrepreneurship's all about opportunism. Gas station raises its prices on the Friday before a holiday weekend. Is he an evil opportunist? What do you think? It's all part and parcel of what he must do in order to achieve maximum success in his business. Because at other times during the calendar year, there are price wars in his neighborhood. And he sells his gas for less than it costs him in order to stay in business. If he's in an extremely competitive environment, he sells his gas at a loss the entire time in order to get repair business into the bays. There's all sorts of fluctuations in his business. He better make maximum profits when the opportunity presents itself in order to compensate for the times when he can't make any profit at all. Person who owns the convenience store in the middle of a gang-ridden ghetto where nobody else will open a store. And he mostly sells to people who can't get 20 miles away to the nearest supermarket. Therefore, he sells at double what you could buy the same products for if you could get to the supermarket 20 miles away. Is he an evil opportunist? Well, would you go open a store there? If his store's not there, how do they get anything at all? His risk is enormously higher than the guy 20 miles away with the supermarket. 
every time he walks into a store there's a pretty good chance somebody's going to walk in the door and blow his head off or try his theft rates probably four or five hundred percent worse than the supermarket 20 miles away for assuming all of that added risk shouldn't he be an opportunist getting all this stuff out of your head and being okay with being the predator is necessary for maximum money about those less fortunate by the way I have my favorite list actually I have two lists just trivia but this is this is the average person's list of reasons for not doing well some of them we hear from our people everybody in my city buys by price nobody in my town uses credit cards everybody in my town is whatever there's a giant advertiser in my town uh, I never get to good leads if you got salespeople you hear that one uh, it's the time of year there's already too many doohickeys in my town that's the opposite of the people we talked about yesterday who are all panicked that some of them are going out of business <laughs> Um, I hear this from clients. I like this one. What I do is so unique, nobody understands it. Uh, uh, let's see. It's the economy. It's my spouse, my staff. Now, here's here's the less fortunate list. This is these are from actual interviews. This is people's biggest problem is getting to work on time. Okay, this is why they don't do well. Here's why they can't get to work on time. Sometimes my car won't start. Okay? The damn bus driver comes early. Mm -hmm. these, are, I mean, I, these are actual interviews. I'm not making this up. I'm I can't hear the alarm clock. I used to have that problem. I put a coffee can on top of it. <laughs> when it rings, you hear the sun. The dog hides my shoes. Is this incredible? I just can't get going in them. I'm not a morning person. Well, so I shouldn't be required to get to work in the morning. I'm not a morning person. The seven is better. My mother was never a morning person. <laughs> it's mom's fault I can't get to work on time. It's hereditary. <laughs> it's just too tough. It's unfair to ask somebody to be there at exactly the same time every morning. Now get this, these are the less fortunate people you are supposed to feel sorry for while you're making money. But they believe it. That they, of course they believe it. But see, their beliefs are not our responsibility. Okay. That's, not, that's not our problem. Okay. Our beliefs are our responsibility, not theirs. You can't, you can't in any way help this nitwit who thinks because her mother couldn't get up in the morning that she can't get to work, you can't help her by making less money. That does her no good. And you don't hurt her by making as much money as is humanly possible. She still get, ain't getting to work. She's not going to get there any later because you made an extra mill this year. She's going to be just as dysfunctional as she is now, no matter how much or how little money you make. Mm -hmm. I like on page 11, Andrew Carnegie, the redistribution of wealth deal, mm -hmm. Carnegie says, give me two numbers, the world's population and the value of all my assets. Then give this idiot 16 cents because that's what it divides out to and get him out the door. <laughs> Best answer to the redistribution of wealth argument I ever heard. <laughs> you can divide it all up and don't make it. You can take it all away from everybody that's got it. There are three states right now who have proposed excess wealth taxes. All right. The first one is the state of Vermont, from which a presidential candidate by the name of Howard Dean is running. You might not have noticed. <laughs> Um, uh, they have proposed a special tax on millionaires. This is a this is redistribution of wealth scheme. This is if we take an extra ten thousand bucks a year from each of the millionaires who live here, they won't miss it. 
They don't need all that money. And then we can redistribute it after, of course, the government eats its 72% overhead. We can redistribute it to all the people who don't have any. And how will this help anybody? It won't. All it will do is convince a bunch of millionaires to move to Connecticut. <laughs> That's what it will do. I flew, people don't get this, I flew cross country one time with Walter Mon Mon Mondale as my seat seatmate. And we had a lively conversation. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to tell you something. Is that a I, bonus I came away convinced that he devoutly believes that you, and, 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 and I'm not implying the man's dumb, because he's not dumb. He devoutly believes that you can actually tax business. He thinks that. Just like these people now think you can tax these millionaires, take money away from them, and have no ramifications. Well, see, businesses don't pay taxes. Customers pay taxes. Nobody that runs a business ever absorbs a tax. You guys know that. You run businesses. What do we do? We do one of two things. They raise our taxes, we raise our prices, or we cut jobs. We don't take a cut. I've never taken a pay cut. Somebody whacks me with a new tax, somebody else is going to pay it. I'm not. Exact same attitude about my divorce settlement. <laughs> That's why it didn't really bother me. I mean, I said, I don't know exactly who's going to pay this, but it ain't going to be me, mama. <laughs> you know? Somebody else is forking this dough over. Well, that's how business people think. That's how you should think. You get whacked with an excess tax, you're not going to pay it. Mondale thinks the business pays it, and nothing else happens. These redistribution of wealth guys think you can actually tax these millionaires and nothing else is going to happen. You, they're just going to sit there and let you take money away from them and not go get it back. <laughs> they're going to get it. Housekeepers going to go from five days a week to three days a week. They're not going to buy a boat this year, which if enough of them don't buy a boat, there's a whole bunch of people in the boat business that aren't going to work. Somewhere, they're getting the money. And I don't care if they got a hundred million, they can't stand to lose ten thousand. Nor should they. So Carnegie's argument was brilliant. Now, here's my question for you. What is, I don't have the slide, page 12. What is your entrepreneurial responsibility? What is the entrepreneur's responsibility. What must you do in order to be fair and just and deserve your place on the planet? Well, here's what a lot of people think. They think your purpose, your responsibility in life is to provide jobs. You see that reflected in the communities that are busily trying to pass laws, and in some cases, communities and states suing companies to keep them from moving or closing, because their responsibility is to provide jobs to the community. Is your responsibility to provide jobs? I hope you don't think so. A lot of people think your responsibility is to pay taxes. You were put on earth for the purpose. I, here's what I want now. I was telling somebody this the other day. I, th I think we'd all be happier with this program, by the way. I just got my tax bill. I want pictures like of Iraqi citizens and welfare recipients. I want like when you send money to the starving orphan deal and you get the picture and you get a letter once in a while, you know, about how they're doing. I think every taxpayer should get some of those and have people sign to them. So for your money, you got a picture up here of these 17 Iraqi people and these four welfare recipients and this retired guy. So you can put them all, all, all the people you're supporting up on the refrigerator and they should all have to write you notes every once in a while, let you know how they're doing. I'd feel better, wouldn't you? 
is, is your responsibility to improve your customers' lives. Better get that out of your head. In our business, this is fatal. And it really isn't any other business. Now, it's pretty smart to sell them things that if they use them as you intended, will improve their lives. That's smart. But it's not your responsibility to see that it gets done. Nor should you lose any sleep over the fact that many don't. And in my business, see, a whole lot of what I sell, I mean, all kidding aside, the shrink wrap don't come off. And you will kill yourself in my business if you worry about making them take off the shrink wrap. Mostly, they just get mad at you. Not my responsibility. I didn't have any of the fun of giving birth to them. They ain't, they, 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 they ain't gonna support me in my old age. They're on their own. Here's the thing, use it, don't use it, don't matter to me. It's my, one of the great lessons I learned early in life in the multi-level industry was I didn't want to be there. <laughs> because your money's dependent on actually getting them to do something. Lousy position to be in. Want the money and then leave it up to them to do something. If they do, they do. If they don't, they don't. And so again, like in my business, look at the numbers. We got what? 150 people here out of 46,000, <laughs> all right? Why? You're the 150 you took off the shrink wrap. Am I losing sleep about the, whatever that number is, 45,800? No, I got over it a long time ago. You got to too. Right. If the guy puts the shed in his backyard and never moves the crap out of the garage into the shed and still can't park the car in the garage or has a, has a more probable result, he moves all the crap out of the garage into the shed and then restocks the garage with more crap <laughs> and still can't park the car in the garage, should Paul go out there and give him his money back? Hey? <laughs> well, yeah, sell him another shed. That's exactly right. Now we're getting it. Yeah. Sell him garbage removal service. Sell him uh, how to do a garage sales kit. Sell him something. That's sell them something. The entrepreneur's responsibility is this. Maximum profit and wealth to his shareholders. If you're the sole shareholder, that's you. Then your responsibility is just to play fair. Not lie, cheat, steal. Those Ten Commandment things. What do you want to bet, Jay? And actually, I, you may even have a comment on this. What do you want? Here's what Jay does, by the way, part, on one of his businesses, is with chiropractic offices, the inbound call, well, with, with any business, by the way, but with chiropractic offices, the inbound call is critically important. You spend a lot of money on advertising to make the phone ring, and then Barbara is the one answering the phone. And there's all sorts of mechanical problems. Barbara thinks it's a receptionist function, not an inbound sales function, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what do you want to bet that in many cases, Barbara's inability to schedule a lot of the patients and motivate them to show up is actually rooted in a lot of stuff going on in her subconscious about the fact that the doctor charges too much he makes too much money, he's doing too well, he's driving too nice a car, and this poor, this poor person who needs care, it's unfair for that person to have to pay so much money. What do you want to bet? Jay, you got... Yeah, he tapes all the calls. He private audits the calls. Okay. Which, by the way, if you haven't done this, you've got to call your own, you've got to mystery shop your own store, your own office, your own place of business a lot. Because you will be really shocked at what happens. Get somebody who knows what they're doing, somebody in your mastermind group, we do it in our coaching groups, to crisscross call and play prospect and tape the call for you. You'll be nauseated. Okay. You'll be sick. You'll be terrified. 
But a lot of it is this. And so they don't have insurance. Here's what goes through the person's head. Oh, my God. When we taught prepay, <laughs> we taught chiropractors prepay. That is, how many of you have been to a chiro chiropractor? OK, good. So you know the drill, right? You go in, you exam the x-rays, the report of findings, which is the sales presentation. Okay. Well, it's supposed to be. <laughs> um, where they show you the x-rays and tell you your spine's going to fall out if you don't come in 18 times a week for the first six weeks and five times a week. OK, you got it, right? Well, prepay is case presentation. And so it's 18 times a week for the first three weeks and six times a week. For that, and that all totals up to $7,862. And there's three ways you can take care of that. You can take care, you get your checkbook out, take care of it in one payment, and you save 800 uh, or you can do it in three payments, predate the checks, uh, or uh, we got a household finance contract here, and uh, we can get you a loan. Now, it's done a little more elegant than that, you understand, but that's the deal. By the way, you can take a chiropractor who's barely keeping the light bill on, and you can take him to $40,000 a month like this if he'll do prepay, because he only needs four new patients that he can close. When we talk prepay, the mechanical process of this, by the way, works just like their fire alarm sales presentation works. If the doc will actually do the presentation, if he's bad, one out of four will say yes. If he's pretty good, two out of four will say yes. If he's really good, three out of four will say yes. But even if he's bad, one out of four will say yes. If he'll just run the presentation, we had to kill to get anybody to do the presentation in part because they didn't believe anybody would give them the money, but mostly because they felt all kinds of guilt about asking somebody for $70,000 in advance. And no, uh, we're coming up to a break pretty quick anyway. We can deal with it on a break. Um, but then, if we could get the doc to do it, the next problem was the sabotage by the staff. Because where's their head at? This poor person with no insurance is coming in here. And they're an they're a office manager, which is what I am. And I know they can't afford. And Doc's driving a Jaguar, that miserable SOB with his excessive profits. So how hard is Barbara going to work at scheduling that appointment? Not very hard at all. Consciously or subconsciously, she's going to keep that person out of the office. Happens in all kinds of businesses. The reason more stuff isn't sold, because of all the guilt. That's why more stuff isn't sold. Let's do one more before our break. Here's one that will get us into all kinds of trouble. Let's try 13. Here's the key word on this page. Just. If you want to underline something, underline the word just. Because the implication of this, here's how people respond to this if they believe it. They think that their lack of success or the way to be more successful, their lack of money or the way to get more of it is to scrub harder, is to be a more deserving person. And they equate the fact they don't have what they want to them not being a sufficiently deserving person. And if I just scrub harder, things will turn around for me. Now the, medica, now, the metaphysical version of this is equivalent. The metaphysical version of this is, I'm just not using the mental principles well enough. If I just think more positively, keyword 
just, things will turn around. It's another clue to why Hill was broke, Stone was rich. It's not the main reason, but it's a clue. Many of you know or know of Foster Hibbard. We're going to talk about some of his stuff a little later. When I got Foster, Foster was in the metaphysical version of this category. Foster believed in the word just, not justice, but the just. All you should have to do, all you had to do in order to attract unlimited wealth was to get this right, to live the philosophy. He didn't get that you had to apply it in an environment where it had a reasonable opportunity of producing money and you had to ask for the dough. Missed that part. So he's running around teaching prosperity to everybody with no prosperity, which pretty much, by the way, describes 90% of the people who run around and teach prosperity. If you want a great analogy to this to help you try and get rid of it, it's the argument that 9-11 was our fault in whole or part because we have so much and other countries have so little. And because we have an immoral society. And so if we were just more moral and we were just more generous, we wouldn't deserve what happened to us on 9-11 and it never would have happened. Therefore, we should close the Defense Department and take all that money and divide it up between the less fortunate people in all these other countries, and we should spend it on churches and moral education in this country, and we don't need a defense department. You like that plan? Well, if you don't like that plan, you can't like this plan either, because it's the same plan. It's the same idea that if all we have to do is make ourselves more deserving people and somehow the wealth will then fall out of the tree. No, it won't. Some of the gentlest, kindest, most deserving folks on the planet are broke, stay broke, always broke. Some of the hardest working people on the planet. See, some people, so, well, we were talking about this a little bit yesterday, but I'm always amused. I mean, some business people actually think they're working. I have clients say to me, I mean, there's a guy in the room right now who could be making four times the money he's making. Oh, I, don't want, you know, I don't want to run a 16-step sequence and worry about getting all that mail out. It's too much work. Hey, the people who are really working hard are the people making minimum wage. They're working. The folks who work for us, at the, you want to see somebody work, you come spend a day at the track. These people get 200 bucks a week per horse to take care of a horse. Most of them have, have three horses. They get there at 6 o'clock in the morning. They work until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm talking hard physical manual labor. Most of you may remember that. <laughs> I'm talking hard physical manual labor. Mm -hmm. At 1 o'clock in the afternoon, if they're lucky, they go take a nap. Five of night, nights a week, when we have live racing, they start again at 6 o'clock at night. Depending upon how late a race their horse is in, they get, they, they, they get done between 11 o'clock at night and 1 o'clock in the morning. And the next day, they're back at 6. In this climate, in the winter, the barn ain't heated. Right. In the summer, it ain't air conditioned. It's a barn. Okay. So they're either sweating or they're freezing. They're getting stomped on, shit on, peed on, kicked, rolled over, all for no money. They work. Most of us wouldn't last a week. Okay. I mean, you'd be laying on the ground. Huh? You want me to do what? You know? Hey, a big revelation since I was there as a kid. When I came back, they switched to wheelbarrows. 
This is a this is the late this is the big technological improvement in the whole deal. I'm serious. When I left, you put the shit in a big basket and you hiked it up on your hip and you carried it the length of the barn and then you heaved it into the big wagon where they come and haul the manure away. They put ramps on the wagons. Somebody figured this out after 50 years. <laughs> they put ramps on the wagons and they use a wheelbarrow. They have that in Carthage. Huh? This is the wall. Well, this is the big technological improvement in the racing industry is wheelbarrows. Nothing else has changed. I was gone for 20 years, everything else is the same. Okay? This is it. So now they use wheelbarrows. But I mean, still, this is back breaking manual labor, long hours. I'm sure it violates some kind of federal labor law somewhere. Okay? Chat, as, as bad as they may be, Every one of his guys who actually goes out and does the pest control jobs works a lot harder than he does. They don't get near the money he does. Hmm. See, it doesn't have anything to do with work. God forbid it should have to do. I mean, if we revise that whole system, let's pay people based on the hard work that they do. You can't run an economic system that way. You got the most money going to the dumbest mules on the planet. Nobody's left to run anything. It all collapses. So it's not work. Right. So whether we're into the Harrisons with their, again, I, whatever Christian, Catholic, I mean, Jewish combination guilt thing that you guys got burdened with, or we're into the metaphysical sackcloth and ashes crowd, it's pretty much the same deal. Everybody's, everybody's focused on this word just in this paragraph, and if I was just better, if I was just, now, does being better help? Yeah. Does being a better person help? Sure. Should you try and be a better person? Sure. Uh -huh. Does being a more moral person help? Sure. But alone, is it going to get the job done? No. Uh -huh. Some of the gentlest, kindest, most moral people I've ever met are walking around with empty pockets and empty refrigerators at home. And some of the hardest working people you and I could find anywhere on the planet got empty refrigerators and empty pockets. And a lot of them are trying to fix it this way. Well, maybe if I go to church four times a week instead of twice a week. Maybe if I go work at a soup kitchen. Maybe if I, if I just figure out a way to deserve it more, I'll get it. The system doesn't work that way. Here's why. It's your next page. Now, I've lost that one. Yeah, here it is. Money doesn't have a conscience. Okay. It's paper. That's all it is. It's just paper. It's not significantly different. We have some printers in the room. It's not significantly different than the paper that's in your book. It's green, and it's got some kind of woven crap in it so that theoretically we can't counterfeit it. But it's paper. Right? It doesn't know if you're a priest or a pornographer. You know, these days. Um, <laughs> I mean, look, it's paper. That's all it is. That's all it is. Nothing more, nothing less. It's just paper. That's it. That's all. Doesn't have a conscience, doesn't know what you are, doesn't know what you do, doesn't care. It just moves around. That's all. If it worked that way, there never could be an Enron. There couldn't have been a Jesse James. Same guys. <laughs> right? Couldn't be. 
because the money would stop before it got to them. It would say, it would put on the brakes, it would speak, it would say, wait a minute. You're doing, you're doing something we don't approve of. We're not coming into your hands. The stuff would work like, you know, Matrix movie stuff. It would voot, stop, go back, and you wouldn't be able to get it. Well, it doesn't do that. As a matter of fact, the second quote's a real good one. Money's attracted to go where it will increase the fastest. The stuff likes to multiply like rabbits. It likes to breed. It likes to go where it will have friends. You know, doesn't want to be in a pocket by itself. <laughs> by the way, that's why you should always carry a bunch of it. The stuff, I'm serious, the stuff gets lonely. <laughs> you know? and if it's lonely, it goes looking for an environment where it's to have some friends. So give it some friends. It comes where it will increase the fastest. Doesn't care what that is. All right? Now, that doesn't mean you should be a pornographer. I'm not suggesting that. It doesn't mean you should run Enron. I'm not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is you've got to get out of your head that by not doing those things and by doing things that are, quote, quote, good, that that alone attracts and multiplies well, because it doesn't. It may make, you know, make your next life a better deal. You may be in the cool place instead of the warm place. You may not come back as a toad, depending on, I mean, whatever your belief system is. It may have enormous impact on that, but in terms of whether the money comes to this pocket or not, no, that, that doesn't, doesn't have any impact. If it did, you couldn't have, pick an industry. I mean, you couldn't have, two-thirds of all the e-commerce today is still adult entertainment. Most people believe that shouldn't be the way it is, but it is. And a significant percentage, I'm always amused, people get all bent out of shape talk about pornography, but they own AT&T stock. Anybody own AT&T stock? AT&T stock. AT&T makes a ton of dough off 900 numbers. They make a ton of dough off the internet access to the porn sites. Anybody own Hilton stock, Marriott stock? How many? Oh, damn. Well, you're in all of it, aren't you, baby? <laughs> um, Hotel industry is in trauma right now because of the lawsuits that are beginning in certain states to try and block them from providing adult entertainment in room movies. Why? Because it's 20% of the bottom line. That's why. You take that out of there, you've got a big problem. Anybody own General Motors stock? A lot of people own GM stock. GM owns a company called Vivid Entertainment. Oh, some people know what vivid entertainment is. <laughs> you can't get more money just by being a better person. Keyword is just. You get more money by doing things that produce money. Let's take us a 15 minute break and start back at 11 o'clock. While we're waiting for people to get in their seats. Um, couple things mentioned me on the break you may find interesting. Make sure I don't screw this up now, Judith. But um, Judith told me of one of her employees who um, every year comes to her and needs a raise, which, of course, by the way, because they need it, you are, of course, obligated to give it. Um, uh, and so man or woman, it doesn't matter, but Okay, so she comes to Judith every year and needs her annual raise. And Judith says to me, and so I sit down with her and I say, fine, you've got a raise as soon as you enroll in this course and you go to this seminar and you study this stuff. And as soon as you enroll, raise is a done deal, not after you finish, right? As soon as you do these three things and get started, the raise is a done deal. My question to her was, how many years have you gone without giving her a raise? Okay. Her answer is 14. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Matt, Matt mentioned to me, I mean, it's priceless, Judith. It's priceless. Um, Yeah, well, I, and I doubt that there's any risk of that at this point. I think, I think, I think you could probably die, and she'd come for at least two pay periods before she gave 